Gracious Father, we thank you for blessing us to be in this place and blessing us to be in the study of you and your name. Oh, Lord God, that understanding and seeking you is our highest endeavor. It's our greatest goal that we may know you and know you in your spirit, the, the sufferings and in your power, all the elements of your graciousness toward us and all of what we are in you because of your calling on us. We thank you for it and we pray your guidance in this, to us in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So today we're going to take a look in the Old Testament in the book of Micah. So go back and turn your Bible back in the Old Testament. Uh, not too far back in the Old Testament. Uh, it's about four books or so back from five books or so back from uh, uh, Matthew. So it's not right there. Uh, it's not deep at the beginning of the Old Testament. It's kind of close to the end of the Old Testament. So Micah, or uh, Mika, uh, Mikayahu, uh, which is meaning who is like Yah. Um, Yah him, uh, uh, Yah meaning give, having a male connotation. So who is like Yah or Yahweh, which is our God. And so in that study, we want to look at chapter four. We're going to start from verse six, and then we'll read from that area in our study, and then we'll talk title or subject matter. Uh, starting from Micah chapter four, verse six. In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth and even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the king shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, why dost thou cry out loud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perish? For pains, have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt eat, go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thy enemies. All right. So kind of an interesting text there, uh, interesting aspect and element of the text uh, from the prophet Micah in the Old Testament, uh, but very powerful and important for us because as children of God, we live in the lifestyle of Christianity, the lifestyle of being a child of God's word, a child of purpose, a child of kingdom. Uh, we are warriors uh, in a sense uh, because we are the king kingdom of God, uh, of the army of the kingdom of God, effectively. And we have a mission, and that is to share the gospel and the ways and the nature and the lifestyle of the children of the Most High God. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful commission that we have. We, we help literally bring other people into the glory of heaven. What a great a job to have. And if you're not in the kingdom of heaven, you need to join the kingdom of heaven. You need to realize that God is going to win in the end. There are many things that have gone on and many forces that have been arrayed uh, against the kingdom of God, even ever since the time of John the Baptist, as Jesus says in Matthew 11, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God have suffered violence. Uh, there has been an attack. Uh, because the enemy is busy against the kingdom of God. Don't be surprised that the enemy is busy. But more important is that God is on our side than the enemy, and that God's hand is on us to the purpose of developing us into that super elite force that God has designed for us to be, to overcome and to be uh, in authority in his earth. He made us to overcome, to subdue, to have dominion, and to rule his earth, those who are the children of God. That's why we must have good, sound judgment. That's what he gave us, you know, not the spirit of fear, power, love, and the sound mind. 
So we have sound judgment. All right. So in this particular text, let's try to comprehend really quickly uh, that uh, the in Micah, Micah's time period is prior to the children of Israel going into bondage. OK, it's prior to them suffering, uh, going into Babylon, which is actually noted in the text that I mentioned right there. There's a little section in there where he mentions, OK, and you will also uh, be even going into the desert. You'll be going out in the field and even into Babylon. Uh, that's a part of where you're going to uh, part of your impact or your effect in the late uh well I, we say late 700s but it would be early like in a period time of 739 to 731 or so bc uh even all the way down to 715 bc we see micah uh as the uh prophet uh and his prophecy is to both judah and Israel, uh, Judah being obviously the southern kingdom, uh, Israel being the northern kingdom, and that God is saying to through to them through Micah, you need to realize that a lot has gone on. There has been a lot of rebellion against me. There's a lot of idolatry. You have rejected and rejected the prophets so many times. So there is a process of developing you necessary. And even in that that example that Israel goes on, we can find ourselves that there is a process that God is working on us with. God is working, building us up. Soldiers can't just come in and be ready. They have to be trained. They have to break bad habits. They have to take on good habits and uh, practices. They call them uh, evolutions in certain contexts. But they have to take on those developed good habits and practices to be successful in their task. Sometimes, although we don't like it, God is bringing us through things where we are able to take on these good habits, these good things, learning to be righteous, learning to uh, seek peace, learning to love, uh, learning to uh, avoid envy, learning to reject sin in a broader sense. These types of things that we have to learn to do in our nature. We know lying is natural. Babies lie as soon as they learn that they're going to get in trouble. Um, they start um, learning to lie. This is what we jumped off line here. That's kind of fast here, like, <laughs> but we're going to get right back on, God willing, and not get lost. Uh, but uh, it's important for us to recognize that. Let me reboot here. I mean, get ourselves back on again here. Okay, I'm, I'm, I think you guys can hear me and I'm back. All right. Baby, as I was saying, uh, hopefully you all hear me again. Uh, the babies learn to lie pretty early. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot for them to lie. Uh, once they realize the consequences of telling the truth when they've done something that they weren't supposed to do. So uh, it, it takes intention to come away from them things, uh, come away from those practices. So those those are things that God is actually training us to be holy. He says we are a holy uh, nation and a royal priesthood. That means he's intending for us to be something special and unique that the enemy cannot conquer. Who, how did Jesus overcome the world? How did he overcome the cross? He was over what the world had to offer. He was greater than the trials that were being brought to him. Now, none of us like trials, but being able to overcome trials can only be truly um, uh, realize when you've had trials. You can say I can overcome trials all you want to, but until you have overcome trials, you don't know that you can overcome trials. So here is in the book of Micah, uh, Judah and by extension, Israel are being warned. Israel will be soon to uh, feel the effects of a serious army in a short period of time. But uh, Judah has more time to, to maybe recover itself. Uh, but uh, here, the conversation is the Lord saying a word of promise. A lot of things have gone on. They have done things that were not right. Those things are referred to. An example would be here quickly in uh, Micah chapter 3. If you look at 3 and uh, uh, verse 9, hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. See, that's what God is, God is indicting the whole of Israel in general, uh, Jacob and Judah as well. Uh, he said, listen, look at you all. You don't like judgment. You hate judgment. You abhor judgment. You don't want anybody to call out what's, and do tell you what's right. You also pervert equity. You twist up things so you can get away with things. 
and you're unfair in your dealings. So God's noticing that this is part of their situation. Uh, they build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. So here we go. Zion, referring northern, uh, Jerusalem, southern. All right. Uh, you, you're just wickedness is all over the place. The heads thereof judge for reward. So the judgment, how about if, if your judges make their decisions based on who's paying them, right? We call that bribery. We don't like any of those things. People who teach, the priests, they teach, they teach for hire. They teach if you're paying them. They teach what you want to hear because you're paying them. All right. This is his, his kind of complaint. Look at that. Verse 11. They teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will I lean, yet will they lean, I'm sorry, upon the Lord and say, is it not the Lord among us? And none evil can come upon us. So we're basically he's saying, look at the behaviors that the leadership has descended into. Of course, I've got to make a move. Of course, there has to be a change. But my change is because I love my people to recover them. No one likes trials. But the Lord says the trials you go through are going to be for your good. The things that the enemy even brings, God is going to still see to them that they don't overcome you because you are his chosen. You are his elect. Let's take a quick look. If you will follow me over to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, I think it's kind of worth us taking a peek at this. Looking at verse 12. First uh, Peter 4 and 12. Beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, which is to try you. So it's going to happen. Why? Because I have to test you. I've got if, if I bring in new recruits in the military or a police force or a football team, a baseball team, but even even some of those teams, we're going to run. And, and when they're running, they're going to say, oh, this is a terrible trial. This is terrible. My body hurts. My legs hurt. This is this is uh, this is uh, uh, I abhor this terrible workout training thing, but it's necessary for the battle you will face against the enemy. I've got to prepare you. What else has he said? Uh, uh, though some think some uh, though some strange thing has ha happened to you. So in other words, he said, don't think it's some kind of strange thing that you're being tested, but rejoice. Verse thirteen, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You're going to be happy at the end of this trial. Now, back to our actual subject with Judah and then uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, specifically their trial circumstance, which we know has basically has to do with them going into captivity in Babylon uh, for 70 years. But verse 6, the Lord says, I will assemble her that uh, is halted. Back to that, okay? Chapter 4, verse 6 of Micah. I will assemble her that is halted. You've been wounded. That's what it suggested, crippled, injured. And I will gather her that is driven out, been kicked out and pushed out of your place. This is very important because sometimes uh, believers in the modern culture and our modern world, especially Western church, believe that if God is with you, you won't have any trials. If God were there, there wouldn't be any hard times. If God loves you, then there won't be any problems. These are false teachings. This is not true. Uh, when God is with you, some of the things he allows is just to strengthen you and train you. Other things are to discipline you for things that you need to uh, actually be strengthened and disciplined against. Let's read a little bit more. Let's review a little bit more inside of here. He says, all these things have happened, but I'm going to make you stronger. And then he gets to this point. Uh, he says, uh, leadership and, and so forth, uh, Zion and the dominion that you have, the daughter of Jerusalem, understand, why are you crying? Why are you crying out? What's wrong? What are you crying? Don't you have, you don't have your people? You don't have your leadership? And, and God knows they don't because he moved that leadership. God knows that they're no longer able to go to the same uh, system that they had before because they've been overcome. They're going to be eventually overcome by the outside empires that are coming against them, uh, Babylon, and then uh, later on to be some more, you know, Persia and others. But he knows they're going to go through that. And he's saying, don't worry about it, that you're going to go through it. Here's something important. Don't worry when you go through the trial. Why? Why does he say? He says, take the pain. Look what he says. This is hard for us. So we, we're so used to being uh, comforted all the time. Uh, uh, but he says, be in pain and labor to bring forth. Oh, your pain is a birthing pain. This is what he's saying to us. Your struggle is not to kill you. Your trial is not to break you down. The things that you go through 
are going to build you up because Christ is in you. You're going to learn more and become wiser because God's Holy Spirit, Yahweh's Spirit will be in you and he will bring things up to you and remember in remembrance to him. And you will learn even more. You'll be greater and you'll be stronger and you'll be even more successful because of what will happen with you. Like a woman in travail, don't worry about it. Yes, when you're birthing a child, it's suffering. But when you're done with the birthing, the reward is so great when you see that new life that has come into the world. What a God. He's an awesome God. Similarly, he says, when these things are over, when you go to these places, the Lord says he will redeem you. Let me read just a phrase or two inside of verse 10. Uh, he says, there shalt, there shalt thou be delivered. Where? In Babylon. He said, in Babylon, you're going to even go to Babylon and there you're going to be delivered. This is an important point. God will deliver you in the place where you thought you were going to be destroyed. This is so important as well, because frequently we think, well, they're trying to get me here. But but God is making them point here. Say, no, no, no. The thing, the thing that is here that's challenging you, you're going to be delivered. This thing just reset again. Hold on a second. I will not uh, let you guys miss it. All right. That's two. Okay. <laughs> That's the second one. Okay. But anyway, you're going to be delivered in the middle of that trial that you have in your Babylon. Some people say, well, I don't know if I can make it through it. You're going to be delivered in your Babylon. You're going to be successful in the midst of your captivity. While they think you have you, they have you down. God says, I got you and I'm lifting you up. That's really what is happening here. When they think there's no more strength that could be in you, you've been insulted. You've been uh, humiliated to the point you ought to be nothing now. And God says, oh, no. Oh, no. In the midst of this captivity and these insults, my children will be overcomers and greater and become greater in their success. They will be born again. The implication here is this is a born again experience. What? Yes. Being born again is actually the implication that's going on here. I'm birthing you again. I'm bringing you forward in the midst of your trial. This trial is just to strengthen and build you up. Second Corinthians chapter 12, when Apostle Paul is calling out to God regarding to the, the uh, thorn in his flesh. Watch, watch, watch what God says in here. Chapter 12 of Second Corinthians, verse, uh, we'll just say verse number uh, 9. And maybe 10, yeah. And and he said unto me, so let me read eight so you hear the context. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He wanted to trouble the thorn in his flesh, whatever it was, to be gone. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Ooh, try to comprehend that. In the weakest moment, God says, oh, no, no. You're going to see how strong I am inside of you. That's what you're going to find out. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the more that I now rely and lean on God, the power of Christ is now effectually being uh, demonstrated in my life. More I see God more. Oh, I didn't have a place to go. God sent me, come on, Elijah, to the brook of Kiriath. All right. He sent me to a place and then he had the ravens and so forth to feed me. Right. He he had uh, he showed me what kind of stuff he can do. Then he sends me to the widow, uh, the woman, uh, Zarephath. All right. And, and he says, look, look how I can feed you over here. Look how I can bring miracles to your life. We say we don't see miracles anymore. We don't see miracles because we don't have needs until maybe recently. We don't have a need. We don't call on God for anything really miraculous. Usually the majority of us, maybe now and then when we have an illness, we need to learn how to trust God all the time. We need to rely on him every day, all the day, and not let it be only when there is a trial in our life, but learn it more and more that this is how I live, by faith in Christ. Uh, therefore, verse 10 of uh, 2 Corinthians 12 I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am, am I strong? When I am weak, then am I strong? 
that's what God is telling them way back here, seven, you know, 15 or so BC, that Paul will write later on, you know, 40 something, maybe 50, 60, 80. Uh, about 50, probably. Uh, uh, he, he, he will write for them later on saying, hey, you're going to be stronger. Don't worry. This is a born again process. The Lord will redeem you from this situation. The Lord will deliver you out of this situation. So then with that, we change our viewpoint about the struggles that come our way. We look over here at the book of Romans and consider the viewpoint of what the suffering means. Let's look again to the book of Romans, Old, going back to the New Testament. Here's the word that we, we're going to look at, verse 18, all right, 8 and 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Look at that. What you're going through now shouldn't even be compared to what God is going to make you into. When you see me at the end of my training, let's go back to the military example. You go, you send the kids off to the army sometime, and they're just little scrawny, kind of weak, undecisive, uh, uh, unclear, uh, unsure person. They come back from training and they're confident. Their head is up straight. Their back, their shoulders are strong and back. And you say, who is this? This is the same kid we sent off to the, uh, to the service. Not really. This kid's been born again. He's not the same person. He can't be pushed around. He can't be confused as easily. He can't be uh, overcome easily. He is strong because he has been trained to be a stronger person. Here's what God is saying. What you were going through will be nothing when you see the result of who you will become. Verse 19, for the uh, earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is another great important period, pr principle inside of here. God has basically given us a clarity. The things you're going through is to prepare you for the thing I called you to, right? For God said at the very beginning in the book of uh, Genesis, he says in, in the book of Genesis chapter one, he says, all right, for I've made you be fruitful and multiply and uh, subdue the earth, right? Uh, and have dominion over the earth. How can you do that? How can you have the dominion when you're not strong enough, when you don't have the confidence, when you don't have the assurance and you don't have the endurance to fight for what you're supposed to have dominion over? That's what this is all about. God is preparing us for victory, preparing us for leadership, preparing us to rule his place, his creation. And the whole creation is on hold, waiting for us to get to the point where we say, I'm ready now, God, to carry out the call you have for, for my life. So with that, I will use Apostle Paul's statement in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not the things I go through and all the things I had to go through to receive it. For it is the power of God to, uh, to salvation, to the Jews first, but also to the Greek. The things I've gone through through, they are worth it now. He says, cast not away your confidence, uh, for it has great recompense of reward. Hebrews 10 and 30, um, Hebrews 10, 35. There's a great reward. Hang on to your faith. Hang on to your confidence. Hang on to the things that you have already confessed and declared. And Jesus, your Savior, will keep you in all of it. In Jesus' name, I pray this bless you and encourage your heart. Shalom and amen. God bless you all.